The last three sessions, we've looked at multiples of accounting earnings and accounting book value. The key word is accounting. We are dependent upon accounting judgments and discretionary calls on what those numbers look like. In this session, I hope to focus in on an item in the income statement that is relatively immune from accounting judgments, and that is revenues. In particular, I want to look at what multiple of revenues a company trades at. And in fact, there are two variants of revenue multiples that you will see in practice. One is the multiple of market value of equity to revenues, which is the price to sales ratio. The other is the multiple of enterprise value, the overall value of the firm to revenues. As you will see, the drivers for these multiples are not mysterious. It's the same cash flows, growth, and risk that drive every other multiple. But there is one additional variable that will show up, and that is the margins that these companies are able to generate on their operations. Companies that generate high margins will trade at high multiples of revenues, and companies that don't will not. These last three sessions, we've talked about earnings multiples and book value multiples. The parallel with both those multiples is you're trusting accounting numbers, right? Accounting earnings and accounting book value. To those of us who have become more distrustful of accountants, there is a third measure, which is revenues. Revenue is the one item in the income statement where accounting judgments or misjudgments should not affect that number very much. So it's a useful number to know, right? What are the revenues of the company? What multiple of those revenues am I trading at as a company? That's market value or otherwise. So let's look at revenue multiples. The most widely used revenue multiple is actually a price to sales ratio. What is it? It's a market value of equity divided by the total revenues of the company. But already we're violating a consistency principle, right? The numerator is a market value of equity. Revenues belong to the entire firm, not just to equity investors. It is not a consistent multiple. In fact, if you wanted to devise a consistent version of a revenue multiple, it's easy to do. Replace the market value of equity with the enterprise value. Market value of equity plus debt minus cash. You have a much more robust version of the multiple. It's an enterprise value multiple. But the price to sales ratio still remains the dominant revenue multiple. And part of the reason is in the two sectors where you see it used most often, analysts are saved by their own good luck, I guess. Here's the first sector where you see price to sales ratios used, the technology sector. You know why they get away with it? Because those companies tend to have very little debt or no debt. The other sector where you see price to sales ratios are used is retailing. And there they used to get away with it because retail firms tended to have roughly the same debt ratios, the same financial leverage. That's starting to change. But for the moment, let's focus on price to sales ratios and see if we can figure out first what the distribution looks like and then what drives price to sales ratios. Here's the distribution of price to sales and enterprise value to sales ratios for U.S. companies. Notice something? It's not as peaked as price earnings ratios of price to book. It's a much more uniform distribution. What that also tells you is revenue multiples vary much more widely across sectors than earnings multiples or book value multiples, which means that any rule of thumb based on revenue multiples is not going to work. But then let's take a closer look at these revenue multiples. Why do some companies trade at 10% of revenues and others trade at five times revenues? To answer that question, I'm going to go back to a technique we used with price earnings and price to book ratios. The price to sales ratio is a quasi equity multiple, at least the numerator is an equity value. So I'm going to go back to a dividend discount model, stable growth dividend discount model, divide both sides of the equation by revenues. And what I end up with is an equation for the price to sales ratio. The price to sales ratio for a stable growth dividend paying firm is a function of four variables the cost of equity, the expected growth rate, the payout ratio. Those three have been constants. We saw them with price earnings, we saw them with price to book. But there's a fourth variable, which is the net profit margin. How are you going to use that? Companies with high net profit margin will tend to trade at high price to sales ratios. Companies with low net profit margins will trade at low price to sales ratios. The companion variable for price to sales is net profit margin. So when you look at net profit margin and you look at its connection to price to sales ratios, remember that it's a twofold impact. One is when a company's margin drops, you're going to see an immediate drop in the price to sales ratios. But there's also an indirect effect. Holding else con all else constant, if your net profit margin gets lower, your return on equity is going to drop. Your return on equity drops, your growth rate is going to drop. Put differently, when you buy a company with a high price to sales ratio and a high net profit margin, pray and hope that that net profit margin stays high. Because if it starts decreasing, your price to sales ratio will fall 
more than proportionately. So now that we've seen that the price to sales ratio is a function of the net profit margin, and that's a companion variable, let's move on to enterprise value to sales ratios. What you see on this page can be a little intimidating. It's a big equation, but here's the bottom line. The enterprise value to sales ratio for a company is a function of four variables too. And here are the four variables. First is the cost of capital. The second is your expected growth rate. The third is your reinvestment rate. And the fourth is your operating margin. In fact, compare those to the four variables that drove price, uh, price to sales. So instead of cost of equity, you're focusing on cost of capital. Instead of growth in equity earnings, you're looking at growth in operating in income. So payout ratios, you're looking at reinvestment rates. And finally, instead of net margin, you're looking at operating margin. The same principles apply. You can make this a two-stage model, a three-stage model, or a 10-stage model. The variables are not going to change. So in terms of enterprise value to sales ratios, the companion variable is your pre-tax or after-tax operating margin. So let's put this into play looking at a company, a company with a very high after-tax operating margin, Coca-Cola. Because of the fact that it spun off its bottling operations, Coca-Cola's major product is the syrup that it sells, and the costs for that are minuscule. Not surprisingly, its after-tax operating margin reflects that business model. In this particular valuation done a few years ago, the after-tax operating margin I used for Coca-Cola was 18.56%, and that percolates through the valuation. Because of their high margin, they have a high return on capital. Because of the high return on capital, they have a high growth rate. And if you trace it all the way down, the enterprise value to sales ratio I estimated for Coca-Cola, given their margin, is 6.10. Basically, I'm telling you that I would expect Coca-Cola to trade at 6.1 times revenues. An astronomically high multiple, you might say, but given their margins, exactly what you'd expect. So when you look at margins, keep that in mind. And if you buy Coca-Cola, you're making a bet. You're making a bet that those high margins will stay high over time. If they st stay high, you're okay. But if those margins ever come under assault, remember what I said about net margins, the same will apply here. Your enterprise value to sales ratio can melt down in a hurry and will melt down disproportionately. One final thing that enterprise value to sales ratios can be used for. We hear a lot of talk about brand names, both in accounting and in valuation. Here's my perspective on a brand name. Here's what a brand name allows you to do. It allows you to charge a higher price for exactly the same product. It gives you pricing power. It shows up in your margins. So if you ask me to value a brand name, here's the way I would do it. I'd value a company with its existing margin. Then I'd say, what? Well, let's assume you lose that brand name that you have, the pricing power. What would your margin become? I'd revalue a company with that new margin. The difference between those two values would be my estimate of your brand name value. So as an example, if I valued Coca-Cola and I came up with 6.1 times revenues and I was told, hey, you forgot to add the brand name value in, my response is, no, it's already in there. If I've done a good valuation, the brand name value should already be incorporated into the valuation. There's no garnishing allowed in intrinsic valuation. In fact, let me show you how much of Coca-Cola's value comes from its brand name. And this is from a slightly later valuation. This is about five years ago. I valued Coca-Cola at about $80 billion using an intrinsic valuation model. Again, I used a high margin, high growth rates. I gave Coca-Cola the credit for all the good numbers that it has. Then I revalued Coca-Cola assuming it lost its margin. You say, how are you going to come up with those numbers? It's fairly simple. I found a generic soda company called Cot, C-O-T-T. It's a Canadian company. I replaced Coca-Cola's margins with Cot's margins. So this isn't Coca-Cola versus Cot. It's Coca-Cola with its own margins versus Coca-Cola with COTS margins. When I replace Coca-Cola's margins with COTS margins, which are 5.23%, they again percolate through my valuation. That lowers my return on capital, lowers my growth rate, lowers my value. In fact, it lowers it to about 15 billion. You want me to add a brand name premium for Coca-Cola? I just did. The brand name premium I've attached to Coca-Cola is $64 billion, the difference between the two valuations. Now, can you do this for all companies with brand names? It's easier for some companies than others. The reason it works so easily for Coca-Cola is you could argue that the only reason Coca-Cola sells for a higher price than generic sodas is not a quality factor, it's brand name. It's much more difficult to apply this in businesses or products where in addition to brand name, you have quality differences, service differences, and product differences.
It's much more difficult to isolate the value of Sony's brand name or Apple's brand name using this approach, but at least you have the mechanics of how you could break down the effect of brand name on value. So in summary, revenue multiples might be safer in some sense than earnings multiples or book value multiples. But if you're using revenue multiples because you don't trust accountants, guess what? Even there, you're going to be called on using accounting numbers. You need to know what the margins are. And for those, you need accounting earnings. There is no getting around the fact that no matter what multiple you use, you are still dependent on accountants doing their job fairly well.